The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, straight out of the 520 and the 85638 with a 10 star and a radial invasive projectile. Plus, we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Alliance of Equals by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller, all right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain editor Tony Daniel. Hey, this time our own David F. Sharrod hosts the first part of a two-part interview with David Boop, the editor and authors Robert E. Vardman, David Lee Summers, Nicole Givens-Kurtz, and Peter J. Wax, who are all part of the great new weird Western fantasy anthology straight out of Tombstone. David conducts this interview in his own inimitable fashion. And by the way, David F. Sharrod is the editor of the anthology The Year's Best Military, and Adventure SF Volume 3, which was out last month. And, hey, remember, you can vote on the best story in that anthology. Instructions are in the book and at the Bain.com website. These votes need to be in by the end of August, though. So um, if you want to do that, get that anthology, read those stories, and um, give them a vote. There are some great writers in that anthology. I think you'll love the anthology, of course. It's got David Drake, William Ledbetter, Casey Ezell, Sharon Lee and Steve Miller, Michael Z. Williamson, and Paul D. Filippo. So get the anthology David F. Sharrod edited and go vote for that and put some dough into the pocket of your favorite writer and give them encouragement to keep writing more short stories. Meanwhile, listen as David talks with the straight out of Tombstone Sheriff Boop and his deputies in yarn spinning in the first of a two part interview, Padna. Plus, we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of the Leaden Universe novel Alliance of Equals by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. First, here's the news. There's new fiction and nonfiction on the Bain.com website. The free short story this month is a great one from Travis S. Taylor. In the not-too-distant future, a band of insurgents have disappeared into a crowded cityscape They are in possession of a quantum key distribution box that is entangled with the uplinks of the U.S. Army forward operating base. They've got the Enigma box of the good guys, and now it's up to a green second lieutenant to go in with his platoon and take them out. He's got the most advanced military technology on the planet, however. Time is running out. This one's called Force Multipliers Being What They Are, and it's by Travis S. Taylor. So check that one out. Out right now, by the way, is a book by Travis Taylor and Jody Lynn Nye, which is a young adult science fiction novel called Moonbeam. For nonfiction this month, we have an excellent piece by biochemist Philip A. Kramer on suspended animation, past, present, future, and science fictional. Hey, this is the same Philip A. Kramer who won the Jim Bain Memorial Short Story Award for 2017 back in May. So talk about a multi-talented individual. It's a really cool article. Humanity has always had an uneasy relationship with death. In short, we'd like to avoid it, if at all possible, or at least extend our lifespans by a few or a few hundred years. Science fiction is full of stories of people entering into suspended animation, only to wake up decades or centuries later. It's also an excellent means to cheat death while crossing interstellar distances. So in this month's free nonfiction essay, biochemical research scientist Philip Kramer explores what might be possible when it comes to the field of suspended animation and what's upcoming, what people are working on now. It's really uh, fascinating. The article is called Stas is the Future of Suspended Animation by Philip A. Kramer. And also up is the story Force Multipliers Being What They Are by Travis S. Taylor. And both are up at Bain.com on the front page, so check them out. This is part one of a two-part interview conducted by David F. Sharirad with David Boop, the editor, and several of the authors of Straight Out of Tombstone, a weird Western anthology. Part two of the interview will be available next time on the podcast.
Hey everybody, it's David F. Shirod here on the Bane Free Radio Hour talking about another great short story anthology out now from Bane. This one is called Straight Out of Tombstone and it is a collection of all new weird western stories. Here to talk about it with me is the editor of Straight Out of Tombstone, David Boop. He is a Denver-based speculative fiction author. He's also an award-winning essayist and screenwriter. His debut novel, The Sci-Fi Noir, She Murdered Me with Science, is back in print from Wordfire Press after a six-year hiatus. Additionally, David is prolific in short fiction with over 50 short stories and two short films sold to date. While known for the weird western series The Drowned Horse Chronicle, he's published across several genres, including horror, fantasy, and media tie-ins. He regularly tours the country speaking on writing and publishing at schools, libraries, and conventions, and uh, he'll be talking with us this evening. Uh, David Boop, thanks so much for being here. Oh, thank you so much for having me and, and, and all the authors. Thank you. Yeah, Absolutely. Uh, also, here is uh, Robert E. Vardaman. He is the author of almost 100 published fantasy and science fiction novels and scores of short stories. He has written extensively in the Western genre, including many weird Westerns, under the pen name Jackson Lowry. Most recently, or Lowry, most recently published is Punished, a Weird Western Novel Trilogy. His work has been nominated for the Scribe Award, Western Fictioneers Peacemaker Award, and uh, for numerous New Mexico, Arizona book awards. In addition to his writing, he has edited anthologies, such as the Bain Books published Golden Reflections with John Saberhagen and Career Guide to Your Job in Hell with Scott Phillips. Uh, Bob, thanks for coming on and talking with us. Oh, thank you for having me. Oh, I wanted to add one thing to the small bio. The Western Absolutely. Fictioneers just awarded me a Lifetime Achievement Award for writing Westerns. I'm just inordinately proud of that at the moment. Oh, absolutely. That merits mentioning for certain. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, also here today is uh, another David, David Lee Summers. He is the author of 10 novels along with numerous short stories and poems. His writing spans a wide range of the imaginative form uh, from science fiction to fantasy to horror. His debut novels include Vampires of the Scarlet Order, which tells the story of a van of vampire mercenaries who fight evil, and Owl Dance, which is a Wild West steampunk adventure. His short stories have appeared in such magazines and anthologies as Realms of Fantasy, Cemetery Dance, and Gaslight and Grimm. He's twice been nominated for the Science Fiction Poetry Association's Riesling Award. Uh, in addition to writing, he's also edited such anthologies as Maximum Velocity, The Best of Full Throttle Space Tales, and A Kepler's Dozen, along with the magazine Tales of the Talisman. Uh, David, thanks so much for being here. Hey, thanks for having me. It's a real thrill to be here. All right, and also here is Nicole Givens Kurtz. She is the published author of the futuristic thriller series Sybil Lewis, and she's more than a little bit weird. Her novels have been named a finalist in the Fresh Voices in Science Fiction, Epi in Science Fiction, and Dream Realm Awards in Science Fiction. Uh, her short stories have earned excuse me, an honorable mention in L. Ron Hubbard's Writers of the Future contest and have appeared in numerous anthologies and other publications. Uh, Nicole, thank you so much for uh, being here today. Oh, thank you for having me. And finally, we have Peter J. Wax uh, back with us uh, on the podcast. Um, he is a best-selling cross-genre writer who has worked in various capacities across the creative fields in gaming, television, film, comics, and most recently, when not busy editing, he spends his time writing novels. He began in the creative fields as a child actor and model, most notably an extra on Revenge of the Nerds and Thunder Alley. How's that for a uh, piece of trivia for you? Uh, in gaming, he was the lead designer and story writer of Cyberpunk CCG, a consultant for Allegiance, and both a writer, ter excuse me, a writer and editor for multiple books in the Interface Zero line. <clears throat> Peter's first comic, Behind These Eyes, garnered a finalist spot for the Bram Stoker in 2012. Currently, he has published five novels, four novellas, and appeared in 16 anthologies. Uh, he has been a panelist, guest speaker, and guest of honor at a combined total of over 250 conventions, trade shows, organizations, and colleges. 
uh, Peter, thank you so much for uh, joining me back again on the uh, podcast. We talked about uh, Little Green Men Attack, and now we're going to talk about uh, some cowboys, aliens, and vampires. So, yeah, Awesome. Thank you for having me. Um, I wanted to talk to... Uh, <laughs> I wanted to talk to, uh, just open this up. This, as we said, is an anthology of weird Western stories. And, uh, many of our listeners will probably be familiar with that, but it is somewhat of a less familiar subgenre. So, uh, I wanted to talk and maybe David Boop, you could open this up since you're the editor, uh, and then we can ask the other folks on what is a weird Western and, uh, what distinguishes it? Um, as a subgenre, and maybe give us a few examples uh, of of what makes a weird western a weird western. I'd be happy to. Uh, weird westerns have been around a lot longer than people give them credit for. Um, but really, in the public eye, you have to go back to the Wild Wild West TV series as being the first wildly or widely recognized. Uh, weird western uh genre uh crossover so a weird western is if you take a western and you cross it with any genre uh horror fantasy science fiction um paranormal uh you know you can uh kind of blend uh another genre in with a western then you end up with a weird western something that deviates just a, a little bit sometimes from the norm uh, sometimes these it can be alternate histories, sometimes they can be secret histories, uh, and sometimes they can just be really crazy stuff, as, as uh, my authors uh, provided me for this anthology. Uh, there are some great stories, and they, they run the gambit. So um, a couple other examples, Briscoe County Jr., Cowboys and Aliens, um, and I'm sure some other people will uh, voice some others as, as they pipe in. One that comes right to mind, uh, this is David Summers, uh, is the, is Jonah Hex, is a pretty major one uh, from the comic realm. Anyone else have uh, either another example or um, maybe some uh, tweak you want to put on or add to David's definition of a weird Western? I'm Nicole, but I think, like, in terms of weird Westerns, I always think of it being an open frontier. And so it doesn't always have to occur in the American West. Um, if you look at Firefly, uh, the television series, or if you look at um, Cowboy Bebop, and, and David Lee Summers and I have talked about this at length, um, about that, I mean, if you think about Star Trek, uh, Roddenberry sold it as Wagon Train to the Stars. And those are all weirdly Western in the sense that there's this expansive frontier that is uncharted, unknown, with unknown dangers that can be from the gambit of magical to alien. and that in essence, can encompass a lot of weird, quote, Western stories. Yeah, uh, one of the things that I've noticed recently is the Western is exactly the same as science fiction now. It's a world that no one has lived in. It's a world that has to be described in great detail if you want the reader to understand what's going on. So it seems very natural to me to be able to make a weird Western because you're doing science fiction or horror or fantasy and you're using the West as a background. And the thing about horror and Westerns, I think, that mesh well, they both require isolation. In the West, it's the big sky. It's the limitless horizon. It's being on your own and having to cope on your own. With horror, the idea is to separate the uh, protagonist from any help whatsoever and put them out on their own. So the two mesh very, very well, I think. And actually, going back to what David said about uh, weird westerns being around um, a lot longer than we think about is you can even go back to something like Gene Autry, and his very first serial was The Phantom Empire, which was this whole secret empire underground out in the out in the West. And he goes and and you know it's it's a science fiction uh, weird western kind of blend. And I think uh, you know that just goes back to the whole idea that this even goes back to the 1930s and even before. You know, some of the earliest uh, westerns uh, to some degree were were weird westerns because they were exploring this whole idea of what strange things could we find out in the unknown West. 
Well, in the 1860s, the- I think it was about 1868, there was the steam giant of the plains. And that's pure <laughs> science fiction, but it's uh, uh, set in the West. So it really goes back to the pulp era and in the mid-19th century. Yeah, the dime novels, that was definitely what I was going to mention is, yeah, the uh, the one that Bob uh, talked about is really, we had steampunk before there was, you know, steampunk. Uh, so it, it's, it, it's kind of cool that this has been around, but it's also sad that the public is not more aware of it, that opportunities we've had to bring the genre forward to the public collective uh, have resulted in things like the Wild Wild West movie, which was not great, the Jonah Hex movie, which was uh, a shudder, uh, and uh, the poor, unfortunate League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Um, and and there's there was opportunities there missed in all of them uh, that unfortunately have kept the idea of the weird western to places like comic books, where it thrives very well, in uh, novels and short fiction, which does pretty good for itself. Yeah, I was thinking you're talking about the pulp days that <clears throat> really even uh, Carter of Mars, especially the the first part of the first book, he is out west um, prospecting for silver before he gets transported to Mars. And there is another example of a um, modern movie that didn't quite connect with an audience. Uh, so... Well, I have to defend that John Carter movie. I enjoyed it a lot. I think part of the problem there was such a horrendously bad trailer for the movie turned people off before they uh, ever saw the uh, thing. I, I recommend the movie. It was enjoyable. Yeah, I will second that. I, I like it quite a great deal, and I think you're right, the advertising, to the point that people didn't realize it was on Mars. Like That's how bad the advertising, people who weren't familiar with the story didn't realize they were on Mars. That's a failure on your advertising part. Yeah, what's the name John Carter tell you about the actual story? Again, <laughs> right, exactly. people don't know anything about the West because they've never lived in the West. They don't even know what a horse looks like in real life, so... Well, David mentioned uh, steampunk uh, a little bit, and I wanted to talk about that. Um, how is the weird Western? Because re- I think steampunk is, although it's somewhat of a niche, it's a niche that is very popular and people know. So how how does the weird Western relate to steampunk? How is it different? Um, is one contained within the other? Uh, and I don't know who wants to tackle that one. We haven't heard from Peter yet. Hey, Peter. <laughs> Why don't you tackle the weird western yeah, no, if, you, if you drop me in there, I'm going to back us up a step and actually go into what everybody missed about westerns versus sci-fi. So you sure you want to start me there? David? Oh, br- okay. Bring it. Bring it. All right. So bring we, it. we touched, we touched on, the, on the stark frontierism of uh, <clears throat> both westerns and science fiction and, and the Roddenberry pitch of Wagon Trail to the Stars. I think that one of the things that we missed is the uh, – okay, I'm just going to cop up. I'm going to fess up. I'm grocery shopping while we're doing the podcast. So you're going to hear some <laughs> weird things in the background. All right? <laughs> and I'm going to be getting some strange looks from people as I do this. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that I, I feel like we all kind of missed is that one of the brilliant things about Westerns as a genre that allows us to explore into science fiction and other genres that we're combining with is the role reversal of mundane versus emotive. Uh, that Westerns deliver. Uh, in the West, you have such a, a stark, constant fight for survival that, uh, that, that the average everyday emotion is something that you don't get to feel necessarily, that you don't get to focus on. Some of the best Westerns go in and turn that, that stark fight into the setting so that characters actually getting to feel things and have relationships becomes this weird, remarkable thing. And pushing that into science fiction, pushing that into other genres, I think, is part of the brilliant thing that a weird Western can actually accomplish. So that's where I wanted to start before going into steampunk. Dave, do you want to chip in on that one? Because I know you and I have gone back and forth on that. That's Dave Boop that has gone back and forth on that one. With me. <laughs> well, I, well, you know, I, I don't know that I disagree with you uh, on the definition of steampunk. I just said that right now it is, it is quite popular to call steampunk future a retro futurism 
look, uh, looking at the future through the past. And in some mm-hmm. elements of steampunk, it definitely is. Uh, Peter and I uh, are in an anthology called Steampunk The Other Worlds, which basically took steampunk into outer space, very Firefly-esque in some ways, where it is basically looking at the future uh, from a, a, a retrofitted past. But personally, I, I look at it more like a deviation of the timeline where we see a, uh, a world where diesel power does not actually kick in when it's supposed to, and we continue on with steam technology for a while longer, uh, developing things like steam-powered cars and planes and computers and robots and, and, and so forth. Uh, I like that, uh, that world view where, you know, it's kind of like, well, we didn't get what actually progressed society forward. So we, we, we basically jury rigged it and, and made it and made our own version of the world we have now, uh, with, uh, with steam technology. And how it connects with the old west is a lot of the, uh, the steampunk genre starts in Victorian England um, and of course that's the same time that we have uh, Western expansion uh, after the Civil War and so forth so uh, it's natural that as steampunk technology is happening in England so would it be happening uh, out west well one of the big things in there David I think is the form matching the function instead of form being form yeah. being separate from function form is no longer mm-hmm. hidden in steampunk and in the weird western it's brought to the forefront and that's why it's not retro futurism because form and function next to each other uh not in the beautiful way that, that steampunk presents it yeah one of the I things i like about you. steampunk is being able to uh Take things like, oh, computers. How do you translate that into a Victorian society? How do you run a computer? Uh, and you go back to the uh, difference engines, Babbage, uh, Jacquard, whatever. And uh, again, what we write isn't science fiction or steampunk or whatever. It's how all of this technology affects the people. And I believe most of the readers of steampunk love the idea of the Victorian morals, the Victorian uh, uh society, the way everything is very well ordered back then. And it's an escape. And I think uh, one of the elements for me of uh, of steampunk, uh, I'll preface my comments by there's a, a very good friend of mine in uh, San Diego who has the, the comment of, uh, it's not steampunk to say it's not steampunk. And that being that steampunk is, is a very inclusive uh, movement. And uh, when people come to me and ask, you know, what do you see as steampunk? And, you know, a lot of times I'll look at them and say, what do you want it to be? Uh, certainly there's a big post-apocalyptic uh, steampunk movement, almost futuristic steampunk. There's, as we've talked about, the, the space westerns have a big following within steampunk. We have, uh, you know, what we've talked about, about the very Victorian uh, steampunk, you know, if you're getting into Babbage and, and the computers and so forth. Um, I, and I think you know if you if you were to plot a, a Venn diagram of what's a West, what, uh, what's a weird Western and then also what's steampunk and put them together, there would be a definite overlap in the middle where you might have uh, where you could tell a steampunk story, a 19th century story set out in the Wild West, and that could be both steampunk and weird Western. Well, you wrote a story, yeah. David, once I remember about kind of a steampunk. Uh... Uh, Frankenstein, if I'm not mistaken, um, that had elements of weird Western. I think it also had elements of paranormal. Uh, it had elements of, uh, steampunk. I mean, it was a little bit of everything. It was, and it was a seamless blend. I remember enjoying that story very much. Um, where, where there were several different elements. There was the science and the fantasy and everything. So you really can't say, oh, I can only mix one genre with my weird Western, or I can only mix one genre with my steampunk. Uh, as we've seen, you know, Sherry Priest did uh, the technology and fantasy, and uh, Gail Carringer did uh, technology and fantasy and so forth. Um, so, 
yeah, you can you can blend a lot of different things with either of the genres. I think that comes out across in straight out of uh, straight out of Tombstone. This anthology, we we have a really wide range of um, of subject matter covered under the umbrella of weird western. So I wanted to talk about you guys' uh, individual stories, but first I wanted to talk to uh, Dave Boop just about how this. Uh, <clears throat> This anthology came about, uh, obviously you have, um, uh, some experience with the genre, but, um, I just wondered, um, where did, where did the idea for Straight Outta Tombstone come from and how did you go about assembling it and getting the, uh, getting the people involved who eventually became involved? Well, I'm hoping that someday the story is going to be legendary, um, because it, it really is a, a series of just, uh, uh, great events that, that, uh, that happened uh synchronous events uh serendipitous even uh but um basically i've been writing weird westerns uh since david lee summers bought my first one back in was that 2005 david um, and maybe 2003 i don't know somewhere 2003 2005 i think somewhere. it was right around uh david lee yeah around 2005 because that would have been what tales of the talisman 2 or something that way like real real yeah. near the beginning of the run of the magazine that's yeah, my story yeah. too. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. David, David's West tales West. of the talisman. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, Nicole. No, I was just saying that oh. my first weird western was also in that that edition of Tales of the Talisman. Oh, that's right, because that's how we met. We were in that magazine together, and we were at a con <laughs> together, and we did we did, we signed copies of it. I remember that now. Yeah. Yeah, I'm still awesome. I, I love see. it bringing authors together. <laughs> well, well, not only that, David was uh, and still is a, a good judge of, of of talent, and he's he's brought a lot of uh, authors uh, into the public awareness with the magazine. But uh, jumping forward, uh, he he published my first one, and then I, I published many others throughout the years, and. Um, and weird western has always been uh, a love of mine and and as i've studied the art form and so forth i thought well you know maybe i would like to edit my own anthology uh, but i didn't want to just go down the same road that that so many of my other uh peers have done um you know really looking for new talent um i wanted to uh explore some of uh, some of my uh, mentors, some of my peers, their most famous worlds uh, viewed through the idea of the Western. Um, so it's, it, it starts with Jim Butcher and, and I at a con together. And I just, you know, he, 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 we were walking out of the con and I said, so Jim, do you have any of your Dresden characters that have been around since the old West? And he said, yeah, a couple of them. I said, could you write me a story for one of them for an anthology? He says, well, how soon do you need it? And I said, I haven't sold it yet, so probably not for a couple of years. He goes, yeah, shoot shoot me a line. And he was the first uh, big name uh, to sign up for it. Little by little, I started taking, uh, or, well, uh, inviting all of the uh, all the people who had helped me in my career in one form or another, uh, you know, David and uh, Kevin J. Anderson, obviously Peter Wax, who's uh, one of my uh, writing partners and and uh, has had my back in so many occasions. Um, I started uh, collecting the, the, the people that meant something to me that I knew could write me something in the Old West. Um, so uh, I gathered up a bunch of names who all gave uh, tentative, yes, I want to write for the anthology. So I'm sitting at, in the Bain, uh, Bain Bar during uh, Dragon Con a few years ago, and uh, I had an opportunity to sit next to Tony Wysikoff. And uh, so I'm sitting there, and she goes, so, you look like you want to pitch me something. What do you want to pitch? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, um, well, I've been working on this uh, weird Western anthology. She goes, ah, I don't know if Bain is weird Western. And I said, I have nine New York Times bestselling authors wanting to write me stories set in their bestselling worlds. She goes, you know, maybe Bain is weird Western. 
<laughs> and so um, I got together a proposal, and she liked it, and uh, the rest, they say, is uh, alternate history. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, it, it was a fun project. It was uh, amazing. The the stories everybody gave me. Uh, you know, I'm I'm nobody. This is my first uh, editing job, at doing a full anthology. I'd been an acquisitions editor. I'd edited for newspapers and things of that nature, but I had not done something of this nature uh, before. This type of project, certainly not with these names. I mean, you know, Alan Dean Foster gave me a Matt Amos story, and he is like one of the first science fiction authors I ever imprinted on uh, as as a child, uh, you know, reading Splinter of the Mind's Eye and then going on to read so many more of his, his uh, original fiction. And so, I, I mean, just the fact that he was willing to send me a story, let alone a Matt Amos story, which is one of his most popular characters, I, I just could not uh, believe it. I, I absolutely could not believe it. So, um, yeah, I uh, I had an amazing experience, and uh, it was easy because these people, these authors, these amazing individuals were willing to give me an unknown, absolutely their best stuff. This wasn't trunk stories. They all wrote something fresh and new using uh, great uh venues and everything. I just, I couldn't be more honored for the turnout. And it was hard to choose uh, the stories because, you know, I, I won't tell you who didn't get in, but all of the stories were amazing. Every one of them. It was very hard to whittle down to these 14. And, uh, and a couple of the people who I, I dearly love were right on the cusp, but, you know, we, we got these 14 were the, were the ones that, uh, uh, put to, put it to the, you know, the final vote. And they're just amazing, absolutely amazing stories. Yeah, well, that's that's a very cool story. And, and I, I concur. I really enjoyed uh, reading this, um, <clears throat> this anthology. I think you really put something very cool together. That was part one of a two-part interview with the editor and authors of Straight Out of Tombstone. Part two will be available next time on the podcast. This is another entry in Alliance of Equals, a Leaden Universe novel by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. Beset by the angry remnants of the Department of the Interior and challenged at every turn by opportunist on their new homeworld of Sherbleek, and low on funds, Clan Corval desperately needs to reestablish its position as one of the top trading clans in known space. To this end, master trader Sean Yosgalen and Corval's premier trade ship, Dutiful Passage, is on a mission to establish new business associations and to build a strong primary route that links well with existing loops and secondary routes. But re-establishing trade and preserving the lives of the few remaining members of the clan aren't all of Corval's problem. Matters come to a head as Dutiful Passage, accustomed to being welcomed and feeded at those ports on its call list, finds itself denied docking and blacklisting while agents of the DOI mount an armed attacks on others of Corval's traders under the very eyes of port security systems. Traveling with dutiful trader on this unsettling journey is Patty O'Scalen, the master trader's heir and his apprentice. Patty is eager to make up for time lost due to Corval's unpleasantness with the Department of the Interior, but she is also keeping a secret so intense that her coming of age and perhaps her very life is threatened by it. And here is the latest entry in Sharon Lee and Steve Miller's Alliance of Equals. A chime sounded. Sean raised his head, blinking out of an abstraction of first thoughts. It occurred to him, somewhat distantly, that this was not the first time the chime had sounded. 
or the third. A quick series of taps saved his document and cleared the screen. He spun his chair about and reached for his glass, which was empty. Come. The door opened and Lena Faldum stepped through. Tiny and definite, brown hair just slightly disheveled, as if she had only now come back inside from a turn in the garden. He considered her, most especially, he considered the flavor of her emotions. Determination wedded to a certain wariness. Determination, certainly, he knew Lena to be a determined woman, a healer of rare skill, devoted to helping those who were perhaps less determined to achieve and maintain balance. Wariness, though, that was not at all like Lena. Oh, she was hardly a fool, and certainly he had seen her frightened a time or two in their long friendship. Caution, he might expect. But wariness? I have disturbed your work, she said, pausing a mere three paces into the room. Forgive me, old friend. Tell me when I will be convenient, and I will return at that hour. In fact, your arrival is a happy circumstance, and not only because I'm always pleased to see you, he said. I fear that I may have been overthinking something. It will do me good to step away from it and entertain another problem for a time. He tipped his head and gave her a half smile. You do have a problem for me, don't you, Lena? He expected a laugh. She produced a slightly harried smile. I fear so, she said, drifting forward again and slipping into the chair. No. This was not much like Lena. Sean considered her again as she settled herself. Determination, wariness, puzzlement. Well, would you care for wine, he asked. I'm about to pour for myself as my stupid glass has come empty. I can't think how it might have happened. That earned a slightly less harried smile and a small inclination of the head. Wine would be pleasant, thank you. Lena drank red. He rose and filled two glasses, placing hers on the desk near her hand before he once again took his own chair. He raised his glass, she raised hers. They drank. The wine was pleasant, though spiced with increased dismay. He thought he understood that she was unsure of the best way to broach her topic. Best to leap in with both feet, he murmured. Lena moved her shoulders, neither a shrug nor a shiver. It seems I must, since I have no facts to lay before you, merely feeling. We are healers. Emotion is the primary tool of our trade. Lena sighed and sipped her wine again. Sean allowed a breath of calm to waft between them, which took only the tiniest of liberties with their long friendship. Unless Lena chose to see it differently, of course. She smiled slightly. Thank you, she murmured. She put her glass aside with a tiny click and raised her eyes to his. As we had arranged, Paddy came to class and danced Debriat today. I will say immediately that I have had students who were more eager to embrace the art. Was she disrespectful? Lena shook her head. Disrespectful? No. Perhaps a little disdainful at first, but that is not unusual for one coming to the small dance after having partaken of Menfriot. I had the impression when she entered the room that she had not expected to find so many co-students. Definitely, she was displeased to find John among us. 
She kept her temper, however, and after an initial misunderstanding regarding the timing of our dance, she comported herself well. She reached for her glass and sipped again, frowning. I noted that it was very difficult for her to move in proper rhythm. She wanted speed. Her body wanted speed. To move so slowly was not merely a novelty, but physically stressful. Sean swirled the wine in his glass, looked up to meet her eyes. She is a pilot with a pilot's reactions, newly come from an intense course of specialized training. Lena nodded from which spring John's concerns that the specialized training had been too intense and had unbalanced her judgment. His hope is that the small dance will assist her in reasserting her balance, as he and I have seen it do for other dancers. She paused, and Sean considered her carefully. You have reason to believe that this therapy will not be of benefit to Paddy. Here was the crux. He felt the heat of her frustration, even as she blew out her breath. Paddy is, oh, bah, I will say it, and it will sound like idiocy, but perhaps we too may then parse it into sense. Paddy, old friend, does not relax. Sean laughed. Corval as a clan is driven to succeed. Surely that hasn't escaped your attention. Paddy is very much a child of Corval. Worse, she is one of Corval who has been forcibly diverted from her life path and her plans. She is running hard to catch herself back up. He stopped here because Lena was shaking her head. It is something more than that. Something other than that. You have studied the small dance. What is its purpose, aside from focusing intent? He had studied Debriat, when he had been trader Yos Gallen and scarcely older than Paddy was now. Its principles and purposes had long ago entered his general repertory of skills, trying to isolate its purpose rather than seeing it as a part of the tapestry. Options, he said. Debriot diffuses reflexive action and opens the mind to possibility. Yes, it is, at its heart, a tool to relax and to expand the awareness. Lena drew a hard breath. Paddy does not relax. She is always on high energy, even at the end of our practice, when we sit together and breathe, I saw her. A sharp head shake, as if Lena was out of patience with her inability to find the perfectly correct words. I saw her divert the energy, rather than accepting its benefits. Sean frowned. Divert it where? She gave him a wry look. That I did not see. However, I may make a guess. As she rose to leave, I noticed the suggestion of stone in her aura, as of walls within. Sean blinked. You think Paddy is hiding something and is diverting energy from everything she does in order to keep a secret behind walls? Yes, I knew you would shape it sensibly. Well, he might have done so, but the feat gave him no joy. Not when the next question was, naturally, hiding what? Closely followed by, why hadn't he noticed? But no, he had noticed. The children, all of the children, save perhaps the infant twins, had returned from Runig's rock, changed.
the nature of the training, the very reason for their presence at the rock. Who would not be changed by such things? And he had noticed not walls, but a reserve, certainly. Priscilla had also noticed, and Anthora. Between them, they had made the decision to give the children time to heal themselves, if healing was indeed required. While their elders kept watch, it was a conservative course. Self-healing was in almost all cases to be preferred. I had noticed a certain reserve, he said carefully, not wishing to lie to Lena and equally unwilling to burden her with Corval secrets. I would not have said a wall. Lena nodded. It is well hidden. I think I would not have seen it, but that I had just danced and was thus open to all input. Which leads me, old friend, to the last of the problems I have to place before you today. He raised an eyebrow and inclined his head. She smiled. It comes to me that Paddy is a halfling. He raised his hand. You will say that she is ripe to come into her powers. I ask her as often as I might, without becoming entirely tedious, you understand, and she denies the classic symptoms of onset. I also scan, of course, but I found nothing to indicate a budding healer. I venture to predict that Paddy will come Dramlisa, Lena said. Based on this glimpse of stone, and the fact that it is so very well hidden, yes. She seemed about to say more, but at the last moment changed her mind. Sean, however, knew what she might say, that a Dramlisa coming into her power was a far different, a far more dangerous thing than a healer coming into hers. Such a coming of age might even endanger the passage I will speak with Priscilla. Will you be available to assist, should we decide it best to force the issue? Certainly. One dislikes such methods, as I know you do. But the ship. Indeed. The ship. Lena rose and bowed as between equals, which put a fine point on the discussion they had just completed. Healers discussing the proper concerns of healers. He rose and returned the bow, then walked her to the door. Chapter 5 Dutiful Passage They would break out into regular space within the next ship half day and begin Andiri approach, the passage sending information packets and news ahead. She would be on the trade bridge with father, trading catalogs, questions, offers, invitations, news packets. The catalogs would be her priority. Father would answer queries and review the catalog entries that she marked for his interest, if any. Depending on the planet and the number of traders on planet seeking an early and advantageous connection, the double shift on the trade bridge might be either exhausting or boring. It would, in any case, be a double shift, and she ought really to be sleeping now rather than studying. Paddy sighed and rubbed her eyes. She'd been diverting two hours of her sleep shift to study since the passage had departed Shorebleak, having long ago found that she didn't need much sleep. Not really. Not when there was so much work to do. Not when there was so much catching up to do. Father had said she would be running double time, in effect, taking two lines of training simultaneously, cabin boy and prentice trader. 
He told her, quite seriously, that even with the double-track training, she would very probably not meet her goal of achieving her trader's license on her 18th name day. He had been quite kind and laid the fault where it belonged, on the attentions of the stupid Department of the Interior, which had taken Corval so very much in dislike and had therefore interrupted everyone's proper life course, and not on any deficiency she had displayed. He had said, too, that it was no shame to stand a full trader on one's nineteenth name day, which goal he was confident she could meet. She had chosen to, well, not discount his words, no. She had merely chosen to see them as a challenge. After all, it wasn't as if she had come to the passage with no training at all. She had served two trips as cabin boy on Pale Wing, one of Corval's first-tier trade ships, and would have transferred to the passage herself for the next long circuit, save that Plan B had been brought into effect at the most inconvenient moment conceivable, sending her Quinn, Silvor, the twins, Grandfather Lucan, and Cousin Corrine, scurrying to hide in Runig's Rock. There they had taken lessons of a very different order, in addition to their usual school fare, an accelerated piloting study. Disappointingly, on the Sims, while they had waited for word that Corval's enemy had been vanquished. In truth, their sojourn in the rock had not been so ill as it might have been, given close daily proximity to Cousin Corrine, who was a stickler of the first water. Quinn had minded it, of course, in addition to being all a twitter over Cousin Patrin, when, if he had only taken a moment to consider. But there, Quinn was made of nerves, she had known there was no reason to worry, though she did allow that she might have felt differently had it been her father who had failed to report in, not once or twice, but at all. In any case, eventually they were called home. Or not precisely home, but to Shurbleek, a planet of which no one had ever heard, nor was that circumstance anything to wonder at, once one actually saw the place. It had all been rather bewildering. Indeed, it was still unsettling to recall that Shurbleek was now the home port of Dutiful Passage and the seat of Clan Corval. Father and the Delm, including Uncle Valcon, who had been away for so very long with the scouts, now joyously returned to the clan and bringing to Corval a completely unexpected life mate, who was forthwith revealed to be a Tiazan of Arab. So that was all right. Father and Priscilla, the Delms and Cousin Patrin, all of them had been there, around Liad, when it had happened. All of them had taken a hand in the event. And they had explained very carefully and very thoroughly exactly what had happened, why and what the stakes had been. Not only for Corval, but for all of Liad, and why they dared not fail nor take half measures. Paddy understood the situation perfectly though the Council of Clans had not, which had led to Corval's removal to Shurbleek in the Dayellen sector. Father had explained, privately, to her and to Silvor, why Traella Fantral, Jos Gallen's own house, had to be raised, which had made her angry. Then she found that Jeeves had brought all of her things and had arranged her new suite in Jalaza Cazone, Corval's first and most ancient house, exactly as it had been in her own lost rooms. And perhaps she had, just a little, cried. Well, 
One could have accommodated even so much change in the service of destroying this department of the interior so that it would do no more harm to Corval or to anyone else. But as it transpired, the department had not been destroyed. It had merely been wounded, though badly. Indeed, the department had been so grievously wounded that anyone might have thought they would withdraw from the field. Father told her that this had been expected. Only the department had not withdrawn. They had unexpectedly and perhaps unwisely, after the most modest of pauses to rest and recruit themselves, increased hostilities. And that was why they, herself and the other youngers, and grandfather and cousin Corrine, had been removed from the clan's safe place at Runig's Rock. Not because their enemy had been utterly vanquished and their name ground into the dust, but because there was no certainty that the rock would not come under attack in the mad increase of hostility. One might have supposed from this that the Delm intended them to sit quietly under guard at Shorebleak, but no, that had not been the plan at all. Corval needed to establish itself upon its new homeworld. There were trade routes, trade routes advantageous to ships based upon Shorebleak to be built, alliances to be redeemed, and lives to be lived. Corval, had said Uncle Valcon, in his Melanti as Delm. Corval is ill-suited to the role of mouse. We began as dragons, and as dragons, we shall go on. Here, he had sent a stern look to father and added, quite unfairly, Careful, dragons. Careful dragons meant that the passage herself would not take port at any of the worlds they called upon, but would rather remain in orbit while crew was given leave or went about the ship's portside business in groups of no less than three. Which was a circumstance, Paddy thought, stifling a yawn, not entirely convenient for one who would learn to trade and for whom a solitary ramble around port might reveal treasures untold, or at least unanticipated wares which might be turned to profit. Behold, for instance, Anne Deary. She was already scheduled to go down in father's group, and while she was not fool enough to think that a prentice had nothing to learn from a master trader, her own attempts at trade could not but be influenced by his presence. He might hold himself back, but folk would see the big amethyst ring of a master trader, and they would bargain with him, no matter they spoke to the prentice. It was a vexing situation, and one that she had been considering since the schedule had arrived in her duty queue. She could hardly refuse the assignment. She didn't want to refuse the assignment. It was far more than an honor to watch father at work. And he was going to be concentrating on artworks. Merely she wished to be certain it was her skill that carried her trade, rather than father's ring. She had great hope for the Mylaster scheme, perhaps too much hope. The transaction had somehow acquired a weight in her mind, as if turning the Mylaster around at a handy profit would define her fitness for trade. Ridiculous. Well, she sighed again. Father was a healer, after all. Perhaps he could simply suggest to the breeze that he was a sack of potatoes and thus be safely ignored. Her screen beeped, reminding her that she had been staring at the same page of text for twelve minutes, and without, she thought irritably, having read a word of it. 
She might as well have gone to bed if she was going to waste her study time in dreams and regrets. Irritably, she closed the text, promising herself that she would catch up her deficiency by studying tomorrow over breakfast. Well, no. She needed to review the tolerance tables over breakfast, so she would be ready for her shift with cargo master Ira Barty. Over lunch, but no, she would be on the trade bridge by then. Father had promised a cold tray at the console and a large bottle of tea. Oh, she would find time. Perhaps she would be less distracted next shift and be able to borrow another productive hour from her sleep schedule. For now, though, she'd best go to bed. That was another entry in our complete audiobook serialization of Alliance of Equals by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com, to David F. Sharrod, and to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And a musical review featuring the zombified remains of the high kick chorus from a dozen houses of ill repute, accidentally on purpose flinging feet, thighs, and entire legs over a crowd of rootin' tootin' shootin' rotten dodgy toothless codgers and grave lodgers, plus a great halloo of thanks and praise for David Boop and authors Robert E. Vardman, David Lee Summers, Nicole Gibbons Kurtz, Peter J. Wax, who are all editor and authors from the excellent short story anthology Straight Out of Tombstone. We're going to have part two of that interview next time. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy and keep reaching for them stars, partner. 